Welcome to the Doha Forum. I'm joined here by Robert Malley, the President and Chief Executive of the International Crisis Group. Robert, one of your staff members, Michael Kovrig, was arrested in China last week in what's now become a diplomatic incident. Can you just tell us what's been happening and what the latest is? So he was arrested, uh, detained on Monday, uh, had no contact with anyone from the outside world for several days. Finally, he's a Canadian citizen and so uh, the Canadian uh, ambassador was able to see him. First consular visit just a couple of days ago. Uh, those visits only take place monthly and he's not been able to see a lawyer or, or, or anyone. So this is a completely unfounded. Uh, one could try to speculate as to what's behind it um, and one could, you know, I, I don't want to engage in that speculation but other, others are, are free to do so. What's clear is that there's not been any formal charges. What we hear is some, you know, innuendo and, and, and claims that he might have endangered Chinese national security. I could say for a fact the work he does is the work that crisis group employees do everywhere. It's extremely transparent. Just extremely tell us what open. sort of work he, he da does. Well, if you go on our website, you'll see his work because everything we do is published. And so he will talk to people about Chinese foreign policy. He'll talk to Chinese officials about their foreign policy with the goal of preventing and resolving deadly conflicts. So recently he's spoken to Chinese officials, academics, others about Chinese policy towards North Korea and how best to prevent a uh, nuclear crisis and, and war on the P Korean Peninsula, something one assumes Chinese officials are very much in agreement with. Talked about Chinese poli China policy in Africa, always with the goal of trying to inform Chinese officials and others about how best to, what kind of policies would be most likely to prevent, resolve, mitigate deadly conflict. That's the only goal. We're very transparent. So he, when he goes to China, he's, not, he's based in Hong Kong. When he goes to China, he always meets with officials and he tells them, this is the research, research I'm doing. These are the conclusions we're reaching. These are some advice we could give you. He's invited by Chinese officials to meet. So the notion that he's endangering national security, I think everyone realizes is canard. There are other reasons behind it. And we hope it will be resolved very quickly because it is a, it's an unjust and, and very difficult situation he and his loved ones are, are going through. From, from, a, from a business perspective, what does this tell you about maybe the risks of doing business in China at the moment? Well, I would think from a Chinese perspective, the last thing, the last message they'd want to send right now is that uh, they're not welcome for, for business, for engagement. So it, this is not just about somebody who works a crisis group. This could be a business person, this could be an academic, this could be anyone who now would have to ask the question. And I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions from people asking me, asking our organization, is it safe to go there? Not clear to me why the Chinese would want to put this kind of uncertainty at a time when their relationship, the trade relationship with the U.S. is obviously not ideal, where they're facing questions in Europe. I would think that they'd want to project the image of a country that's very open to foreigners coming there. And if a Canadian, two Canadians now, have been picked up on what appears to be baseless charges in the case of Michael Kovrig, I could say that for a fact. In the case of the other individual, I have every reason to believe that's true too. What does it say to others? What kind of chilling effect will that have on others? So I think the Chinese, in their own interest, would try to resolve this quickly rather than have this drag on. And in, in, for your own <coughs> organization, what, what will this mean for the way you operate and deal with China from now on? Honestly, it's too early to say. Our, our preoccupation uh, has been to secure his quick release and his return uh, to his loved ones. What it will do to our work, I think, we'll, we'll think about uh, at some later stage. Is this sort of this example of arresting people, unclear charges, is this a sort of a sign of increased tensions? What your organization is there too, is, is this a sort of a symptom of increased tensions, strategic geopolitical tensions around the world? Well, certainly it's a sign of increased tensions, I would suspect. And again, I don't want to speculate as to why they chose in this case, but there's no doubt that there's tensions between China and the US, That's, uh, and now between China and Canada related to, to to, uh, to, to, to circumstances that, that people are well aware of. So this is a tense time. It's a time of transition in the international order. I think that's clear, where different countries, great powers like China, the United States, Russia, are each sort of um, jostling for influence at a time when the criteria of the past, the norms of the past, are all being, being challenged uh, for all, all kinds of reasons. And I think we're seeing it here in Doha, different countries seeking new alliances, new alignments asking themselves questions. What is the new order going to be like at a time when the old one seems to be defunct and a new one hasn't yet appeared? I think we're hearing it in the hallways of this conversation in this form. I think we're seeing it play out uh, not just in China, we're seeing it play out in the United States, we're seeing it play out around the world. Um, and at a time when there are questions about what comes after what has come last, uh, what 
what happens most often is that people are testing rules, they're testing norms, so forms of activities are, are being undertaken by states and non-state actors to test how far they can go. And again, we've seen it in this region, for example, with the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, we're seeing it in other places where um, I think people are just testing the limits. And if we talk about this region, we have a blockade here of Qatar, we have the Middle East, Palestinian-Israeli crisis, which is no, not showing any signs of any resolution. We have the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi in Saudi Arabia, and we still have the Syrian crisis, which is not really, even though the guns have fallen quieter, that's not really resolved in any way. Do you see, I mean, your organization is there to try and resolve and help mitigate crises. I mean, are we seeing any progress? In the, in so you didn't mention Yemen, which is the worst humanitarian crisis where we've seen some progress. And I think that's a symptom of the fact that, again, when, you know, when, when there's confusion, where there's flux, where there's uncertainty, a lot of bad things could happen, a lot of very uh, tragic things could happen, and we've seen them. But it's also a time for different ideas uh, where countries want, may want to show a different face and where they may want to, to, to show that they can play a more positive role. I think we've seen in Yemen, again, we just see this very tentative, very fragile ceasefire. Uh, but it's critical that it hold because if it not, if it doesn't hold, you have a country where up to 14 million people could be threatened with starvation. I mean, just the magnitude of it, I think, uh, needs to be absorbed. Um, you mentioned all these other crises. I think what's happened is that these crises have festered, whether it's Syria, whether it's Libya, whether it's Yemen, whether it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we're still in a, in a period of transition for all of them, which could, you know, the most likely scenario we're living in, the, we're here in the Middle East, the most likely scenario is that they're going to go from bad to worse. But that's not inevitable. Um, there is, as I said, signs of some progress in Yemen, because, again, in this period of, 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 of uncertainty, there's been pressure now put on Saudi Arabia, on the United Arab uh, Republic, on, other, on, on the Houthi, to do something different from what they've done in the past. And again, you've seen different countries step up and step in to try to get that outcome. The UN envoy has been uh, uh, more energetic. So I, I think, I think there's, there's, there's always opportunity. And you know, our role as crisis group is to look for those opportunities to push for at least avoiding the worst outcomes in Yemen. That would mean uh, the kind of famine that would occur if, if the Saudi-backed forces were to take the, the port city of Hodeidah. In Syria, that would happen if, if Russia and the regime and, 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 and Iran were to attack uh, the, the, the area of Idlib, where you have a concentration of civilians and, non and, and, uh, and uh, militant fighters. But it would be a bloodbath perhaps exceeding all other bloodbaths we've seen in Syria. Again, the magnitude of that is, is one that people need to, to take pause uh, before contemplating what the alternative would be. So in all these places, the first priority is don't do greater harm than has already been done. And I think you're seeing uh, at least new alignments in the region which may make that at least possible. And then think about the next step, which is how do we resolve these conflicts, which in the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has gone on for decades. In the case of Syria, in the case of Yemen, have gone on now for many, many years. And should the U.S. be taking a more active role, do you think? I mean, the answer is, well, it depends what kind of role. An active, positive role, I would say yes. I think sometimes the U.S. role has not been... Uh, always the most constructive. I think one of the problems now is that we're seeing a kind of fixation in the U.S. about Iran. Now, one could understand that Iran could be a subject of preoccupation. It is not just in the U.S., it is in Europe and elsewhere. But the obsessive nature and the fact that the entire region is now viewed from Washington through the prism of Iran, I think leads to policies that not just are not just not good for the region, but they're not good for the United States itself. And so if rather than saying our goal is to stabilize the situation in Syria, prevent it from getting worse, stabilize the situation around the region. If the goal becomes solely to contain, suppress, push back Iran, I think it's going to lead to a series of negative decisions and decisions that are going to redound very negatively for the region and for the peoples of the region. Uh, so, yes, a more active U.S. role, but always with the caveat that role had better be constructive, that role had better be in the interest of ending conflict, not exacerbating it for the purposes, for purposes that you know, the Middle East has so often been the arena for the conflicts of others. In this case, Syria has been the arena for now a conflict that involves the United States, Turkey, Iran, Russia, Hezbollah. Let's, for once, take a step back, tell those countries, let the Syrians uh, live normal lives and not be the, uh, the, 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 the arena for proxy battle uh, among others. Robert Malley, thank you very much. Thank you.